Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the auction. Please, everyone, give a warm welcome to our two bidders from Web3 Foundation, Switzerland, Jeff. And from IBM Research, also Switzerland, Luca. And now, let's discover today's auction item. Please admire this rare piece of beauty, this unique, totally non-fungible piece of art. A picture of a dog expressing profound statements on life, love, and death. Well, actually, just a URL of the points to a place on the internet where someone's storing the JPEG. Marvelous! Luca, Jeff, are you excited to bid on this fantastic masterpiece? Yes! Let me recall the rules. This is a sealed bid auction, and thanks to crypto, you will not have to trust anyone but yourself. Each one of you is going to cryptographically commit to his bid. Later, when I tell you, you are going to open the commitments and we will learn who wins the item. All right? To start gently, this is a second price auction. The highest bidder wins the item, but he only plays the price of the second highest bid. Do you understand? Marvelous. Jeff, Luca, are you ready? Please show your commitments. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause. And now let's open the commitments. Luca, will you please reveal your bid? One million IUCR coins. Wow, that's some bid. Great job, Luca. And now you, Jeff, will you please reveal your bid? Jeff, may we see your bid? No. Ladies and gentlemen, what a shocker! We have a winner! Congratulations, Luca! The picture is yours! Please do not forget to pay the million ISCRs before you leave. What do you mean? You don't have them? The auction is invalid? I don't think so, Luca. We also, you, bid one million ISCRs. Congratulations! Jeff? Who's Jeff? Second prize? I don't see any other prize. You're so funny, Luca. Thanks for participating, but now we must go on with the show. Please do not forget to pay the million when you go. Bye bye. And that, my friends, is what happens when you try and run auctions without a trusted party. Now, this seems to be a difficult problem, Jeff. How do you run a auction if you cannot force the parties to open their commitments? This seems like a problem that may be solved by MPC, maybe? Yeah, MPC sounds hard. Maybe instead of some kind of timed commitment and perhaps instantiated with a time lock puzzle. Uh-huh, time commitment. By this, I guess you mean something like a commitment, but which after some time it opens itself? Yeah, yeah. Um, except that the you it, it, the commitment isn't just going to open itself. Somebody will have to do the opening. Oh, and so this is where you use the time lock puzzles. Can you say a little bit more how you want to construct this? Yeah. So the the time lock puzzle. It's a you someone constructs a puzzle that they a cryptographic puzzle that they have a, they believe they have a good idea how long it takes somebody to solve, and also where as a process of the construction they understand what the result will be and then they can encrypt to that. Oh, I see. So that would give you a way to encrypt your bit using the solution to the puzzle, and then uh, the other participants would need to uh, solve the puzzle in order to decrypt your bit. Yes. That sounds very smart, but uh, is this going to scale to many participants? No, not really, because they'll, it's the same amount. It means uh, all this work for each participant. Wow, that's, uh, that's a bit crazy if we need to run auctions with thousands of participants. Um, so what other solutions do we have there? Um, ideally, if we want this thing to be scalable, we'd have just one puzzle for everybody. Huh, that's interesting. I recently heard about homomorphic time lock puzzles, or you have this idea where you have many puzzles and you can, without solving them, combine them homomorphically to a new puzzle uh, which encodes the solution to the homomorphic circuit. 
So for example, here we could have everyone encrypt the bit uh, inside the puzzle, and then we run the maximum circuit on the puzzles homomorphically. What we get in the end is a puzzle which contains the solution to uh, who's the winner of the auction. So maybe this could be a solution? So, um, yeah, maybe uh, computing the maximum in, the, in a circuit sounds quite expensive. Well, what you, maybe there's some other way that we can have, have you know, create a puzzle and, and have the, uh, and then extract the key from it later. Uh, so you're suggesting something like we want to encrypt to a public key now and extract the secret key later. Yeah. Um, so this is something that sounds a little bit like identity-based encryption, right? Because in identity-based encryption, what you do is that you can encrypt to an identity, and even if the secret key is not there yet, uh, eventually the master, uh, the, 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 the master authority will produce the secret key associated to the identity. Yeah, let's go over what identity-based encryption looks like. So in identity-based encryption, you have these uh, four algorithms. Um, you have keygen, which generates the master, public, and secret key pair. Um, and then you have encryption, which runs kind of like normal encryption, but where you will encrypt using the master public key pair and the identity you want to encrypt to. And now, uh, to, um, to, in order to decrypt, you first need to extract the secret key from the identity. So this is the operation that is called extraction and that can only be performed if you know the master secret. Okay. And then once you have the, the extracted secret key, you can take a ciphertext, the public master key and the extracted secret key, and you can get back the message. So if this, uh, so if the, we can do it, if this extract operation is slow and doesn't require any secrets. Huh, that's interesting. So yeah, we would just need a slow extraction and then Maybe everything can be public. Cute. We could call this delay encryption. All right. Well, let, let's dig into Bona Franklin IBE because that's one of the simplest ones. Yeah, that's a good starting point indeed. So let me recall. Bona Franklin needs an, a pairing-based uh, scheme. Um, and so you have these two pairing groups generated by, say, G1 and G2. Your master key is a, is a usual uh, elliptic curve uh, key pair. So you have a secret scalar, call it M, and a public key, which is M times uh, G2. Um, and now when you want to encrypt, what you're going to do is you're going to play it like uh, a key encapsulation method. So uh, the pairing will produce some uh, secret, which you are then going to use to do a symmetric encryption. Um, and so what you want to put in the pairing is on the one side, the master public key, so M times G2. And on the other side, you want to put something that's uh, related to the identity. So what you will do is that you will encode the identity to an elliptic curve point, and then apply a secret uh, random scalar, uh, which is going to be an ephemeral secret. Um, and so call this U, for example. Uh, and then this gives you the symmetric key to use. And then it, you also produce a ciphertext, which is going to be the ephemeral U times G2. And this is you are going to send to uh, the decryptor. And now for decryption, you just swap the rules of the secret U and the secret M inside the pairing equation. So on one side of the pairing, you will put the ciphertext U times G2. And on the other side, you need to put M times the identity. Um, so this is something that can only be done by uh, the one who knows the master secret. And so the extraction will consist in computing just a scalar multiplication, master secret times the identity. So this extraction operation is very, very fast, which isn't what we want, but there's, a, um, there's an iso isogeny-based verifiable delay function that um, where the verification equation looks like BLS, except that the, the, the actual you know, delayed the slow delay computation is evaluating a long sequence of, uh, of isogenies and this replaces the scalar multiplication. Huh, that's, uh, that's a very cute idea indeed. So you're using the fact that scalar multiplication are very fast, but isogenies, you can make very long chains of isogenies, which can be as low as you want, and which 
essentially behave a little bit like scalar multiplications, particularly they are compatible with uh, elliptic curve pairings. Um, so let's see, if we put in Boni and Franklin the exogeny here, instead of the extraction, will um, uh, our secret, instead of being a scalar, will be an isogeny, a long chain of isogenies, which is going to be slow. Um, so to derive the master public key, you will, uh, you will apply this long sequence of isogenies, and then extraction will be again applying the long sequence of isogenies to the identity. Um, encryption will still be fast because you don't need to apply the isogeny, you just use something that was completed a key generation. And now all you need to do to make this work is that you just uh, don't make anything secret. Like the isogeny can be public because you need to just run the evaluation. There is one thing that is somewhat secret. The, the identity of the auction has to, be, uh, has to be secret or has to, has to come into existence, be discovered when the auction starts. So there, there's the, the timing of this randomness is important. Hey, these guys apparently just discovered a new primitive uh, and they seem poised to put us auctioneers out of work. But so what exactly is this uh, delay encryption primitive? Um, the analogy with IBE runs even deeper than it may seem at first sight. In IBE you have this extraction uh, function which extracts the secret key from an identity. And here in uh, delay encryption what you do is just that ask this extraction functionality to be sequentially slow. Um, then all the rest runs exactly like in IBE and um, you will just have no secrets. Mm, everyone is capable of running the extraction. You don't need any uh, master authority to, to do this. Um, but now if we look deeper into this analogy, something interesting uh, appears. Um, IBE is known to, of course, imply public key encryption, but also in an interesting way, it does imply signatures. The way you sign uh, with IB is that you encode the message to an identity and then you extract the secret key from this identity. And this secret key will be the signature. And then to verify, you just encrypt and decrypt to this identity. Um, now you can try and play the same trick with delay encryption. Um, and so first of all, of course, from delay encryption, you will get some variants of time lock puzzles, the same way that you get public key encryption from IB. But more interestingly, um, you can obtain proof of work from, uh, from delay encryption. The extraction will be the work, and the way you verify that work has been done is exactly the same. You will run encryption and decryption to the output of the proof of work. And now if you add one more requirement, if you ask the output of extraction to be uniquely determined by the input, then in this case what you will get is exactly verifiable delay functions. And so if you um, apply this transformation to Boni and Franklin IBE, what you will get are BLS signatures. And in an analogous way, if you apply uh, this transformation to the delay encryption that these guys just discovered, what you will get is uh, the uh, DeFeo, Masson, Petit, and Sanso verifiable delay function. Um, so this seems all very nice from a theoretical point of view. Uh, the pieces seem to fit well together. But in practice, uh, there is this sequentiality assumption on uh, chains, long chains of small degree isogenies. And uh, how do we know that this operation really is sequential? Jeff, what's your take on this? Ah, so um, it, it's, uh, so, so evaluating one of these degree two isogenies in this, in this sequence is, um, is uh, it means evaluating two degree two polynomials. This is, you know, these things can be optimized in relatively well understood ways. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's also optimizing the finite field. Um, this is also reasonably well understood. Uh, so, so any massive shifts, it's, it's believable that this could, would, would come from some kind of, uh, you know, fairly major breakthrough. And, um, you know, of course, we actually have to see what people can do in specialized hardware. Yeah, and so since you spoke of specialized hardware, um, the first thing that comes to my mind is FPGAs, of course. How fast do you think it would be in uh, FPGA to uh, run one isogeny evaluation? Okay. So the most similar thing that's happened so far is the, Ethere is the Ethereum's effort to do uh, RSA s squarings in an... Uh, 
RSA group of unknown order, which is different from what we're talking about. Those they get, uh, on FPGAs, they get down to 25 nanoseconds. Um, ours, of course, will with all, lots of field optimizations and whatever else, you know, it will be, this each multiplication will be much faster than that, but maybe 50 nanoseconds. We, we'll have to see. But my understanding is the field sizes are, like the ring sizes are more or less comparable between yeah. RSC and this. Yeah, the, this is, the, the, the field here is, is, is somewhat smaller, but uh, it's 1500 bits, but yeah. Um, that's very interesting. And so how um, many, like if you are thinking about uh, the 10, 10 nanoseconds, something like that, how many uh, isogenies you would need to uh, run through in order to get a delay of, I don't know, one hour, for example? So with, uh, with these kind of uh, guesstimated numbers so far, it looks like we're, we're talking 70 billion. Uh, but remember, there's a, um, each, each of these degree two isogenies, it, it has, a, has, a, field, has a, cur a curve parameter that shows up, and each of these curves is different. And, um, and this, this curve parameter, uh, so we're talking something like 12 terabytes to store all of these curve parameters. So there's, a, there's another feature of this, of this uh, VDF and of the delay encryption instantiated this way, which is that you need to be pulling these, uh, these curve parameters from memory. And that memory bandwidth, it could either, it, it could either be good or bad, but if it matches with your computation speed, once both have been well optimized, this is probably good for the, for the VDF because it means an adversary has to break two things instead of just one. Wow, 12 terabytes of storage, that's, uh, that's insane. So you mean that uh, maybe not the verifier, but the evaluator uh, needs to store all this data and every 20 nanoseconds, it needs to take out of the memory one field element and bring it to the CPU to do the computation. Uh, this is an insane amount of bandwidth. This is like gigabytes per se gigabytes per second, um, and uh, I mean these are not the speeds that you can reach with just common hardware. So this is a very interesting technological challenge. Um, but so. Um, we may try and build the best hardware for this, but how do we know that NSA doesn't go 100 times faster? So um, any, of, any sort of delay primitive, whether it's time lock puzzles or, or VDF or whatever, ha sh should have um, a, a, a safety margin, a security margin. And, and this is often ignored in, in a lot of papers, which is a real mistake. But um, the, you know, if, 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 you, if you know the evaluator runs at one speed, you, you should assume, the, or if you know the honest evaluator runs at one speed, or sorry, the honest prover runs at one speed, then you expect the, um, the dishonest prover can possibly run considerably faster, 10 times faster, maybe 100 times faster. And this just needs to be, so you have two speeds. You have this, this big T speed of the honest evaluator and this little T speed of the of the of the malicious evaluator and their and and their ratio is just a thing you need to bake into the design of the protocol and um, and how confident you are in that ratio really comes out of how you build the hardware okay so if we get back to the auction example this means that uh, um, if you think that little t is the best the anyone on earth can do like nsa can do uh, you will need to receive the bids before this little t time. Yeah. But then you will need to wait a much longer time, big T, to know yeah. who was the, uh, the winner. Yeah, little t has to be little, yeah. So um, you have whatever your little t over your, your, your ratio of little t and big T is, and then you have to choose little t lar large enough for the various network back and forth messages that your protocol needs. Well, this is an interesting technological challenge, but uh, here there is another technological challenge. These uh, isogeny-based delay functions, be them delay encryption or verifiable delay functions, they all seem to need a sort of trusted setup, don't they? Uh, yes. Yeah. So you, um, we have this one curve, uh, super singular curve with J invariant 1728, uh, which we know about, and we, you know, we 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 don't want this to be one of the endpoints of our VD, VDF because then someone could find, uh, could find, could compute other isogenies uh, between different curves that would, that would provide shortcuts. 
Um, instead, what we need to do is to, bef is before setting up the VDF, we need to uh, do a random walk in the isogeny graph and find a, and find a curve, um, uh, and find some other random curve and then forget the walk so that w w this curve has no known connection to the super singular curve of J invariant 1728. Okay, I see. So um, the problem is really with the special J invariant 1720 curve and maybe with other special J invariants. But if I take a random curve, um, then it's fine. I can run these protocols and it, they are assumed to be safe. And so really the only difficulty is that the random walk between this special starting point and the random super singularity curve must be kept secret. And so this is where the trust lies. So maybe we can uh, reduce the amount of trust needed by doing this in uh, MPC maybe. Like for example, what you think of, uh, of this, um, like you have N participants and so the first participant starts from 1728 and then walks to some new curve. Then the second participant starts from this new arrival point and does his own random walk and gets to some new reality curve and then so on, so on. So in the end, if at least one of the participants has been honest and thrown away the information on the random walk, no one should know the path to the beginning, right? Yeah. Yes. So the, the only caveat here is you don't want any of these participants to sort of reset the path back to the super singular curve of J invariant 1728. So they all need to provide a zero knowledge proof that they actually started with the previous guy's curve. Uh huh. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's interesting. Um, and so, uh, yeah, what, 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 options, what options do we have for zero knowledge proofs? Let, let me think. Um, so we have SIDH kind of proof of knowledge, uh, but that, first of all, I don't think they apply to this case because uh, SIDH curves are not really set up the same way. They don't have the same base field. They are very special. Um, so they're probably not going to be useful. Then we have um, C-side uh, style of proofs, like C-sign, C-fish uh, style of proofs, but also those, they are just limited to curves over the prime field, which is not going to be the case here. So these things are trying to be post-quantum, and we don't need post-quantum here. You're right. You're right about this. So maybe we can exploit the pairing equation, which we are already exploiting for the delay function and the verifiable delay, uh, uh, for the delay encryption, excuse me, and the verifiable delay function. So maybe we can exploit the pairing equation to prove knowledge of a secret work. Um, that seems to be the way to go, actually. That's... Uh, that can be much more efficient than, uh, than any other uh, proofs we have. Of course, it won't be post-quantum, but none of this is post-quantum. Okay, that's, um, that seems to be uh, a kind of complete solution to the problem. So uh, we may really have a new interesting primitive to explore. What do you think? Yeah. Okay, that's, um, that's a nice and uh, complete uh, solution, it seems. So we really have a new protocol to explore. And it seems that as an auctioneer, I'm out of work, so I may become a cryptographer now. Um, well, thanks everyone for uh, being with us today and uh, see you at the next uh, delay conference. <laughs>